but your meditation. Oh, hey, 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 Peter. You, you got, get, you got, you got the thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what you're looking for, the language disc? Oh, man, that's, this is exactly what I needed, man. Perfect. Thank you so you're, much, you're, brother. You're welcome, Thank you man. So Always much, man. Fellow oh, Atari oh, fan. Oh, oh, uh, oh, hey. Oh, um, okay, so, so we're here with Peter Fletcher. And tell us what you got here at VCF. Um, we're doing the 40th anniversary of Atari Home Computers. And I got the very end of it here, which is the 16-bit, 32-bit error, 85 through 92. So I've got, uh, started with the Atari 520 ST in 1985. Uh, kind of rushed to the market to beat the Amiga 500 to market. And, uh, but it's basically just a 68,000 reference platform. You don't get the custom chips like you did in the Amiga. But it was very popular with musicians. What, and what made it so special with musicians? Um, Built-in MIDI ports. So it had that right off the bat. The idea was is the timing, the MIDI timing is fantastic. There are people who still use it. Like you can't improve a hammer because a hammer does what it's supposed to do. So there are artists like Fatboy Slim and uh, Atari Teenage Riot and Moby that still use STs for music production because it just does what it's supposed to do. Now I consider this like the, the trifecta. You had the Macintosh, you had the Amiga, you had the Atari ST, all using the same processor. Correct. So what made this machine special as far as those other two systems? What set it apart besides the MIDI? Was there anything else? So what set it apart was is that it came out as color, was the first system with a color display uh, for a 68,000 platform with a GUI. So that was the, that was the first thing. And now, also- The GUI, there's something special about that, isn't it? Uh, the GUI was Digital Research's gem. Apple actually sued Digital Research for Gem on the PC, but left Atari alone for some reason. I don't know. They may not have thought they were a threat. They may have thought it was a little different. What else so did it have? The next thing, uh, the 1040 ST is widely considered the first computer that was available for under $1,000 with one megabytes of RAM. So everyone else above, and prices were higher. So that was the cheapest machine under $1,000 with a megabyte of RAM. So that was- And was thing. it only RAM that set that apart from the 520? The difference was too, is the 520, the disk drive and the power supplies were external. The 1040 brought the disk drive and the power supply internal. So yes, that's the main difference there. So after that, 1987, uh, the Mega came out, um, which was basically Atari's attempt to be maybe a little more professional. So uh, fully mechanical keyboard. Regular ST keyboards are mushy, but that's fully mechanical keyboard. Uh, it had an expansion slot in there so you could put in external graphics cards uh, and a built-in hard drive if you wanted to. So that now, was what's uh, As far as graphics cards, did they, uh, they come out with anything? They did. So you had a high res option there. I think it went to 1280 by 920 or something along those lines, pretty high res. Also, processor upgrades were easier in there because it has a processor direct slot, so that was now, possible. Now, as far as stock, though, I mean, the hardware is pretty much similar to the 1040. It added a blitter chip, so that was the finally that time that maybe it was trying to catch up a little bit on the Amiga with the graphics. There still basic sound though, so not it's not it's not in the same league there. It sounds that. like they were a little jealous of that. They may have maybe? been. They may have been. Uh, it's kind of their same deal. Um, after that, uh, you go to. The Mega STE and the TT-030. So now the E, what does that mean? That's just basically ST enhanced. And what that did is when they added the E line, it added the ability to 4096 colors on their palette. Before, Hand mode, hello. Right, before then it was only 512. Uh, and the other thing about it was is it added DMA sound. So it finally had sound that could rival the Amiga line or, you know, some Macintoshes or, or DOS machines. If we go over to the TT-030, this was Atari's attempt to enter the professional workstation market. Again, supported this ECL mode, which is a really high res, 1280 by 960 uh, resolution. It also supported Unix System 5, but they only released that for probably like three months. It didn't, it didn't sell well, they didn't really do anything. But this machine was very used in Germany for desktop publishing as an alternative to a Macintosh system because you could buy the TT and a laser printer for about half the price you could on a high-end Mac. So it was very popular with that in Europe. I also noticed they kind of changed the case color a bit. This looks quite a bit lighter. Right, so they tried to set that apart. The case is the same and that is different, um, a little bit lighter. And then down here is the Stacy line and Atari made a line of what luggable STs. They weren't really portable per se, but they originally had batteries in them, 
they only lasted like 15 minutes and they decided, well, you know what, that's not really worth selling. So they removed that feature. But these are very highly used on uh, a lot of musicians uh, use those because you could take them with you on the road much simpler than packing up a monitor and external uh, com computer now, system. I always thought there was only three portable Atari STs. That would be the Stacy, Stacy 2, and ST book. But I see something else here. Yes. That so, I don't recall. Right. So this is a prototype. It never hit the market. Uh, I believe this is 1991. Um, this is courtesy of AtariMuseum.com. Let me borrow this thing. Uh, it is basically like an ST with Pen OS, uh, kind of an iPad, but from 1991. That's um, pretty impressive. It, it is pretty cool. Pretty cool. I, I don't know if it's ever worked or if it does work. I, I didn't want to mess with it because it's not mine, but it's beautiful that they let me borrow. Do we know if that was an actual sold product or was this a prototype? I believe it was only a prototype. I don't think it actually got past that. So then from there, the final machine that Atari made was in 1992, and that's the Falcon 030. Uh, and that's again a 68030, 16 megahertz processor, down from the 32 on the TT, but this had the DSP at 32 megahertz. And that's what makes this thing special. Uh, the DSP is used in graphics processing and in sound processing. This uh, was the first machine that was available in the market that did direct to disc audio recording. And when Atari was going out of the computer business, they actually sold the rights to this to C Lab which ended up becoming eMagic, which got bought by Apple, and people use the product Logic today. Well, that was what was used extensively on the Falcon, would have been Logic, so. Right, and Amiga people would probably know about DSPs from that period of time around when the Amiga 3000 was being talked about. The 3000 Plus had it in it. Commodore was planning to have it in the machine, but that never happened. As far as musicians, I know Cubase was another big program. On Absolutely, that. right, and that line continued on from the original, uh, I actually have a Cubase dongle, I don't have it with me right now, but that's a product that has continued uh, throughout the years, all all based on the Atari. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's an Amiga-like product. They have their own things. The Amigas are much better at video gaming and they were much better at video production. The STs were more of a general purpose computer. Um, they, this monochrome monitor that's over here uh, had a 71 uh, hertz display and so it was much easier on the eyes when you were doing, you know, you were typing or using desktop publishing. Uh, so right, most Amiga users know with a 1084, with a 2002 monitor, all the flickering. Right, and you, you don't have that. Don't suffer from that. So if you were using that all day, every day to write a paper or something, certainly a nicer display to yeah. use. And you didn't have that on the Amiga until the 3000 line with the productivity mode. Right, sure. Now I see some other small items here. Okay, what small item would you like to I discuss? See, I see another small item you see, here. You see the links here. Uh, <laughs> so the links, as you know, is, uh, well, many of you know, we're Amiga people. Uh, it was designed by former Amiga engineers. And the, that would be Epix. Epix, right. So Epix uh, software owed Atari a bunch of money, the way I understand. And Atari then said, all right, well, we'll take this product. And that's kind of why I understand that worked out. So uh, that's a Lynx 2 that's been modded with the McWill. Uh, screen enhancement, so it's got a really bright, it wasn't that bright originally, but it is now. And I think there's one last small product over here that a lot ah. of people might not know about. Okay, right, so this is an Atari portfolio. Um, it was the very first palm top laid uh, PC. So it's a IBM compatible to a point. Uh, and uh, you may know it from the Terminator 2 movie, they used it to uh, hack an ATM, this little machine. So that's- And what, that's MS-DOS, right? MS-DOS, yep. So it's not ST related at all. They bought it from a company in England called Dip. Uh, and so they bought the rights to produce them. So that's how they got that. Well, I'll say as always an impressive display and as always an impressive amount of information. Well, I try to- Thank right you now. very much. Thank you. And we'll talk about that disc later. Absolutely. <laughs>